a common complaint you hear among meditators. The question, I've been meditating all this time and I still have a problem with anger or I still have a problem with lust or fear or greed or jealousy or whatever the unskillful emotion is. The expectation seems to be that just by sitting and meditating it's going to take care of everything else. But you have to remember the concentration, the mindfulness, the alertness that you develop as a meditator. All these things are tools, and if you don't actually use the tool, you're not going to get any results. You can put the tool on a cushion, or you can put it in a nice little display box. But unless you take it off the cushion and use it, or take it out of the display box and put it to use, it's as if you didn't have the tool at all. So you can't expect that X number of hours of sitting here with your eyes closed and being very concentrated, very mindful will automatically make a difference in how you deal with emotions as they arise. You have to develop your discernment and how to use the concentration and the mindfulness and the alertness. And the discernment is not automatic. It's not the case that once the mind gets very clear, all these wonderful insights will suddenly come springing up that you can trust 100%. Because after all, some of the worst delusions that meditators suffer from come from concentrated mind. John Fung had a number of students who became quite psychic through their meditation. And in some cases, the, the more psychic they were, the more they were impressed by how accurate their intuitions were. And then when mistaken intuitions came up, they wouldn't recognize it. They wouldn't admit it. Major delusion. And he had one student in particular, I remember, who had extremely strong powers of concentration. And she would come and complain that you know, she still had anger, she still had other problems. Why wasn't the concentration taking care of this? It's for that reason. The concentration on its own is not enough to dig these things out. It just gets the mind calm enough so you can see, if you're willing to see. And it gives you a foundation that you can use to take things apart, to analyze things, to understand why is this that the mind gets upset by these things. This operates on many levels. One typical level is if you know that there's a certain type of situation that you're going into, it's going to create difficulties. You have to prepare yourself. You're going home for the holidays. You know what the family can be like. Well, it's good to sit down and plan. So-and-so tends to say this, or so-and-so tends to push these buttons, and in the past you've reacted. And how can you think about the situation and how can you prepare for the situation so you don't react in those unskillful ways? This is that aspect of right effort that's called preventing unskillful qualities from arising. Now you know they have a tendency to arise, so sit down and think about them. This is a legitimate use of the end of your meditation. If you've been sitting for an hour, Give yourself some extra time to think about these things and plan. Run some scenarios through your mind. In other words, you have to get to know what are your trigger points and how you've responded unskillfully to those trigger points in the past. and try running a few alternatives through the mind and see how the mind responds. Sometimes it will go with the alternative and other times it will come up with a complaint or an objection. You have to ask yourself, is the objection legitimate? This is one of the most important things about being a good meditator is to learn how to be a little bit skeptical about what's going on in the mind.
In other words, you, you test your proposal and then you test the objections. It's not that you immediately go with one or with the other. That's one of the reasons why we train the mind to be with the breath, so it can sit there and not take sides prematurely. Just as when you sit here and a thought comes into the mind, you learn not to run with it. You've got to learn to use this skill in other areas, other parts of your life where things are more rushed, there's a lot more going on. And if you forget the skills you've developed here, you're going to get into trouble. So spend a little time running these things through your mind, getting prepared. And the same principle applies to more subtle affairs in the mind as well. Last night the question came up. Someone said there's these schools of Buddhist thought that say you have to learn how to perceive the world in certain terms. Before you can truly be awakened, you have to have a perception of how empty everything is, and you have to understand emptiness, or you have to have understanding of not-self, or learn how to see things in terms of ultimate realities. And then once you get the correct perception, that's going to take care of everything. Fortunately, the Buddha wasn't as single-eyed as that. He realized that the human mind has many ways of feeding. It's like that story when the, in the canon where the daughters of Mara come to test the Buddha. And they say, men have many different tastes and women. Let's try all different kinds to see what will, will attract him. And so they run through lots of different guises, and they're unable to catch the Buddha with any of them. And that's just lust. The mind feeds on anger in many different ways. The mind feeds on fear, it feeds on worry in many different ways. And you've got to learn how to know your feeding habits. Why do you react in certain ways? What is it about that reaction that you enjoy? The Buddha gives an example when you're analyzing your attachment to concentration. This is a fairly advanced stage, but it's the principle applies all across the board. He says you look at the state of concentration, you learn how to see it as aggregates, and then look at the aggregates as inconstant, stressful, not-self, a cancer, a dart, a dissolution, all kinds of different ways of driving the point home is that these are not things that you want to stay attached to. Now, some people will respond to the inconstancy. Some people respond more to the not-selfness. Some people respond more to the idea that they're a a wounding or a disease. There's another place where he says you should learn how to see the aggregates as murderers. They're, they're chewing you up. Because has one memorable story of this man who wants to kill a king. And so he gets into the king's service and becomes a reliable servant of the king. And then one day when he catches the king, when they're just one-on-one, -on -one, kills him. And as the Buddha said, the man was actually the king's murderer even before he got into the king's service. And every day when he was getting up before the king and going back to sleep after the king and doing everything the king told him, he, the man was still the king's murderer, because that was his plan. He said, it's the same with the aggregates. Right now you can use them. Your body is very helpful. When you want to get up, it'll get up. When you want to eat, it'll eat. If you want to do work of different kinds, it'll do it for you. But it won't always do that. And then it's going to turn, these aggregates are going to turn on you. I have a phrase in Thai, Dai Jai, which means that you trust something so much that your all of your skepticism dies. 
And that's where we are with many things in life. And the Buddha has to remind you to remind yourself these things are not totally dependable. So there are many possible angles by which you may just suddenly decide that these things you've been feeding on are not worth it after all, that you lose your taste for them. Now, the concentration is there is to give you something better to feed on. But it's not always obvious to the mind. Most of us say, well, we can do the concentration and mindfulness at one time, and then we can have our other pleasures at another time. What's the problem with that? And the problem is those other pleasures are going to turn on you sometime. And where are you going to go then? If your concentration hasn't been fully developed, you're going to be lost. So you do have to reflect on the advantages of the pleasure of concentration, the advantages of that sense of stability and clarity that come with the concentration. So when you're dealing with lust, or you're dealing with anger, or you're dealing with fear, learn how to observe the whole process, the object, say, of the lust, and also the actual sensation of the lust in the mind, what it's doing to you, the object of the anger, and what the anger is doing to you. And try to look for where it is that you get your pleasure out of these things, why you enjoy feeding on it. And then try to develop whatever perceptions are necessary to help remind you that okay, it may seem reliable, but it's not reliable. It may seem pleasant, but it's not really pleasant. It may seem something that you have under your control, but it could go totally out of your control. It may seem healthy, but it's a disease. That's one of the mind's big arguments. Well, this is just the way a healthy mind has to, has to function. If it's not allowed to give in to its, its passions, it's going to get all messed up. Like those monks and nuns in the, the old Ken Russell film. I've forgotten the name of the film, but the, the nuns were going around with their heads at a 90-degree angle. They were so distorted by their lack of sex. You walk into the movie, and you realize about this, what this movie is going to be about. The heads aren't going to stand straight up until they've had sex. I walked out of the movie and said, I don't need to see a movie about that. But there is that aspect in our society that says if you don't give in to your passions, you're going to get all distorted and crooked. You have to say, well, wait a minute, killing, stealing, cheating, anger, these are the things that are crooked in the mind. These are diseases. These are wounds in the mind. So in every case, you have to develop a perception that's an antidote that focuses right in on the area where you like to feed on this particular emotion this particular way of behaving, to show that it's not what you thought it was. It's not worth it. Sometimes you hear, hear it said that we latch on to things because we have a sense that they have a permanent essence, that there's something there that's inherent in that thing. Well, that's one reason that we latch on to some things. We think it's permanent enough that it's going to be lasting, it's going to be worth whatever effort is necessary to put into it, because it'll last. But that's only one reason why we're attached to things. I mean, the ultimate underlying principle all across the board is that we think that whatever pleasure we get out of something is going to be worth the effort that we put into it. Some things we know are not going to last forever, but we say, it's going to last long enough when I'm going to get pleasure enough. So you have to learn how to, learn how to analyze your tastes and things, to see why you're attracted to something, and then use whatever perceptions the Buddha applies or whatever perceptions you can think up on your own that will counteract your initial perception to show that what you thought you were getting out of this, you weren't really getting out of it. The satisfaction you're going to derive from this was 
going to turn on you at some point, and you'll end up worse than you would have been otherwise. And whether you're focusing on the, the not-selfness or the pain or the wounded side or the disease side or the emptiness side or whatever, that's an effective antidote for your particular attachment. Those are the perceptions you have to develop. To learn how to read your defilements. And the more clearly you understand them, the more effectively you'll be able to counteract them. So the concentration and the mindfulness and alertness are here to help you with that project. But you have to put them specifically to use to get their full benefits. <laughs>